But there are usually one or two teams that end the season uh, without a loss. But it was kind of big news when the engineers of Massachusetts Institute of Technology finished their 2000 regular season, 2014 regular season last year with nine wins and no losses. That's because MIT is much better known for its students' high academic achievements. Its alumni, for example, have earned 81 Nobel Prizes. So it was a big surprise when a university better known for brains than brawn had such a successful season. But maybe that surprise reflects preconceived notions. We are surprised that an institution known for its academics achieves athletic excellence. And we're surprised when we hear of college athletes who perform at a higher high level and are also outstanding academically. We shouldn't be surprised, however, any more than the folks of Nazareth should have been surprised when one of their own could also preach a fine sermon and achieve some fame as a prophet and a healer. Last week, incidentally, I commented on Jesus being described as rich. And I said that there weren't many references in the Bible that I knew of anyway that described him as being financially well off. Ruth our musical guest last week, reminded me that carpenters back then were among the wealthy. Jesus would have been considered, as a carpenter, to be among the top percentile financially, <laughs> since he had a skilled trade that the vast majority of his contemporaries were undereducated or uneducated. A lot of them were probably unemployed. So anyway, the folks from Nazareth shouldn't have been surprised at the things Jesus was doing. But it seems that they were. Listen to what some of these people said about Jesus. Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Isn't this Twice before in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus had taught in a synagogue, and each time he met opposition, once from an unclean spirit and once from the congregation. In this case, however, it was his neighbors, including, we assume, friends and relatives, who turned against him. What might have started as a friendly and curious observation quickly changes as these people drop <coughs> themselves into an attitude of skepticism, asking question after question until they find themselves opposed to what Jesus was doing, opposed to his ministry. Let's look at what Mark has to say. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, page 817. Just to trick you a little bit, I'm going to be reading the message. So you don't have to do a little trans transposing here. Chapter 6, 1 to 13. Jesus left there and returned to his hometown. His disciples came along. On the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting place. He made a real hit, impressing everyone. The old Bible says the people were astounded by him. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise all of a sudden, get such ability? But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. 
We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling. And they never got any further. Jesus told them, a prophet has little honor in his own hometown, among his relatives, on the streets he played in as a kid. Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there. He laid hands on a few sick people and he healed them. That's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left and made a circuit of the other villages teaching. <coughs> Jesus called the twelve to him and sent them out in pairs. He gave them the, the authority and the power to deal with evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeals for funds. Keep it simple. And no luxury ends. Get a modest place and be content there until you leave. If you're not welcomed, not listened to, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then they were on the road. They preached with joyful urgency that life can be radically different. Right and left, they sent the demons packing, and they brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies, and healing their souls. <laughs> Oh, and it's the reading. <coughs> and that is Somebody told me once that the definition of an expert is anyone who lives 50 miles away. <laughs> so if somebody comes to preach to us or speak to us, if they live 50 miles away, we think they're an expert. I live 50 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus should not have been surprised <coughs> by the attitude of the people. Mark tells us earlier in 321 that when his family heard about his actions, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying he has gone out of his mind. Later, Jesus was told that his family had come after him, maybe for the purpose of dragging him home. But later in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus was asked who his mother and brothers were, he said, here is my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Something else a little odd occurs in Mark's telling of Jesus' visit to his hometown of Nazareth. In addition to asking if this is the carpenter, not the carpenter's son, but the carpenter. They note that Jesus is the son of Mary. Now why is that odd? Because normally in that society, one would identify the son by the name of the father. Maybe they mentioned Mary because by this time, Joseph was no longer alive. But some biblical scholars wonder if Calling to mind the story of the virgin birth, which some in a small village might not find believable, they are questioning his parentage by mentioning Mary instead of Joseph. Just as Mark tells us that hometown folks were amazed at the skills that Jesus demonstrated, which caused not necessarily admiration, but disbelief. Mark tells us in turn that Jesus was also amazed at their disbelief. And because of it, Jesus was able to accomplish very little, almost nothing, except, as you remember from the reading, a few healings. We can assume that the rejection by the people of Nazareth was a great disappointment for Jesus. Maybe that's why, while Jesus is identified by others as Jesus of Nazareth, he himself 
is never quoted as saying, I am Jesus of Nazareth. There is no easy fix when we are deeply hurt by people we thought we knew well. No band-aids to cover deep pain and disappointment. Matter of fact, sometimes we can hardly keep from being paralyzed because of destructive emotional pain. I spent the day like this past week in the dentist's chair and he numbed me, thank goodness, and asked if I was okay. And I, you know, it's kind of hard to talk when the dentist asks a question. And it's tough. Anyway, I said, physical pain is fleeting, but emotional pain and spiritual pain, that is the last thing. Still, it's worth noting that Jesus may be hurting having been rejected by his hometown family and friends, goes right ahead doing the work of the kingdom. Mark says that he went about among the villages teaching. Although this neither fixed anything at Nazareth nor undid whatever pain Jesus might have been feeling, he continued doing his ministry. That at least represented something positive after a painful situation. And when we respond with something positive after something painful, we are walking in his footsteps. When we continue the work of the good news by teaching Sunday school week after week or attending board meetings or or visiting shut-ins, or saying our prayers regularly, or sharing our gifts, studying our Bible, expending our energy in the work of God's kingdom. We are doing as Jesus did after being rejected in his hometown. Once again, understand that Jesus' hard work did not solve his problem. It didn't heal the family problem but it still represented a positive reaction to a negative situation. It's worth noting that Mark's gospel is the only gospel that identifies Jesus himself as a carpenter. However, unlike our society, which places high value on skills that people possess and develop, that doesn't sound like the compliment that it might sound like for you and me. A lot of that has to do with the value that a society gives to work. In the Roman Empire, much of the work was done by slaves or by people who were just a notch above slaves. In general, the elite did not consider work either as a virtue or a pathway to respectability. Slavery also affected the way Americans, prior to the Civil War, looked at work. While Northerners generally saw hard work as a pathway to self-sufficiency and respectability, many Southerners who owned slaves looked down upon hard labor. President Grant, for example, when young, <coughs> worked hard as a farmer, but discovered that his wife's family, who were from the South, criticized rather than admired him. Jesus did not share this prejudice. In his ministry, he related to workers of all kinds. For instance, Jesus is not pictured as speaking to the commanding officers of the Roman army during his ministry, but he interacted well with the centurions, those officers who rose as commoners and did most of the grunt work for the army. And of course, in his parables and in his teachings, 
he taught about farming, shepherding, building, housekeeping, coming. I wonder how much success our revolutionary war efforts would have been if we relied strictly on the aristocrats, and not so much as the workers, those who were willing to get their hands free and do the tasks that needed to be done so that we, 240 years later, can enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy. Now, I'd hate to think of what would have happened during the Revolutionary War if only the educated, the trained, the rich, the privileged were allowed to serve in the army and attempt to win our independence. I'm guessing we would be living in a much different world than the one we're blessed to live in today. People from Nazareth had a problem believing that carpentry for the work of teaching, and for the ministry, and for healing, and for performing miracles. Indeed, they seem to think that being a hard worker, a carpenter, disqualified Jesus. Is this because they valued some kinds of work more than others? The real question is, like the one raised by the sports writer, who seem to think it odd that the students at MIT might make good football players, if we assume that people engaged in some professions are disqualified for work in the church or work in the community? Or do we restrict church work to only people who play musical instruments or sing well or teach the little kids or preach the word? Whatever work serves the kingdom, whatever benefits those Jesus referred to in Matthew's Gospel as the least of these, is the work of the kingdom. Farmers engaged in the hard work of planting and harvesting, students and academics, white collar accountants, blue collar plumbers, people with no collar. All are qualified to be the face and hands and the heart of Jesus. You've heard me say this many times. You might be the only Jesus some people will ever see. Jesus' family tried to control him, to bring him in. His neighbors tried to limit him his ability to serve God because of his profession as a common partner. Do we, you and I, do we try to control what is right or wrong for ministry, for family, for friends, for youth, for senior citizens, for little children, folks from all walks of life? Because we have already decided for God what God others in this church we share, or in the communities in which we live, or in this country, the greatest country in the world, and all the freedoms that we enjoy. Do we put limits on the expectations of people because they look different from us, because they love different from us, because they work different from us because they worship different from us. We cannot put people in a box. God can do anything. God can use anybody. The prophet Amos was a herdsman. The apostle Paul was a tent man. Some disciples were fishermen and one was a tax Patriots who fought to free and form our country were farmers, barkeepers, students, over age, under age, rich, poor, black, white, straight, gay. And Jesus was a simple carpenter from a small village in the Or 
Bavaria, we need to get to work. And we need to do it in the spirit of Jesus Christ. If you have any prayer requests,